Hello, hi, welcome everyone to another episode of Generative AI and I with Ranjani Mani. So Generative AI has been compared to this iPhone moment, uh, one that has disrupted the way we communicate, bringing in historical technological changes um, and the advent of these new apps and business models. Now, this isn't really a space where there are a lot of experts. Everyone is on a learning journey and the ones who will stay ahead are the ones who are curious. And that's what this is about. So in this podcast, we will talk to the builders, the doers, and the leaders. And with one goal, to help you understand and stay ahead in this new machine-generated creative new world. Please note that all the opinions expressed in this podcast are personal. So with that, without much further ado, let's get started. And I'm quite excited to have our uh, guest this uh, evening. Today, we are going to chat with Ranjit. Shetty. He's the partner at Yonest Yosh, uh, as a VC, and um, he is also the managing director for India at Everstream Analytics. His focus areas include taking the founders on a journey from ideation through Series uh, A and beyond, and also in enabling customers to generate revenue from cutting edge high tech solutions. So the first time I was talking to Ranjit, I think one thing that struck me um, is how he's both a builder and a strategizer, right? And very few folks exist within both. So he has this mix of practitioner view and also the understanding of the larger uh, ecosystem. So something we focus on a lot today is how we can democratize the AI tech stack. Ranjit, super excited to have you here. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjini. Awesome. Yeah. So today we're going to focus on three key areas. We'll talk about Ranjit's journey and uh, his experience in the space. Um, we'll then switch over and talk a bit more about the AI tech stack. What does it mean to democratize it? And finally conclude with how India can leverage this moment to move ahead. So uh, with that, Ranjit, why don't you tell us a bit about your background and uh, more about your interest in the space? Sure. Um, so, you know, um, I think um, uh, I have been uh, in the tech world for around 28 years, uh, doing startups mm -hmm. actually uh, from 1997 onwards, mm -hmm. uh, multiple startups, um, multiple acquisitions that I've been through. Uh, I've mostly not been the founder, but I've definitely been one of the key engineers and mm -hmm. uh, later on one of the key executives and things like that. So. Uh, so I think uh, 15 years of executive management or 15 or more years of executive management, roughly speaking, uh, you know, multiple international teams and things. Like that. So that's on the uh, execution side, uh, you know, uh, designing, executing, making sure customers are happy. Right. Uh, also on the investment side, um, mm -hmm. I've been involved uh, in investments for at least 10 plus years now, uh, mm -hmm. maybe 12. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, le the lessons that I learned from the startups, the ones that I was in, uh, mm -hmm. You know, I got an insider's view of how did they succeed? How did they fail? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was very educational for me. Uh, so, it, it, you know, on one hand, I was I was one of the engineers and then, you know, one of the leaders and what have you. Uh, right. But there's also the sense I got a view from the inside of how we're succeeding and sometimes how, you know, we're failing. Mm -hmm. uh, but also a very close view of uh, how the ecosystem is working. Right. So whether I was in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area or mm -hmm. whether I was in Bangalore or in Pune, it's mm -hmm. always been uh, very close to cutting edge technology. And uh, mm -hmm. that gives me a lot of joy. I think mm -hmm. working with people uh, gives me a lot of joy. So my mm -hmm. journey has been a lot of observation and learning from on the basis of that, right? So uh, that's why I find the journey very exciting. And, uh, you know, that's where generative AI coming in is mm -hmm. like you said, an iPhone moment. It's just mm -hmm. changing the entire industry. Uh, it, it's changing actually industries, uh, you know, not yeah. just the tech industry, right? So, yeah. uh, so I'm super excited to be, you know, in observer mode, but also practitioner mode and also mm -hmm. investor mode, kind of, you know, mm -hmm. so enjoying mm -hmm. that journey. Uh, uh, yeah, so I've been involved, for instance, in, in the past with uh, internet devices uh, that got acquired by Alcatel. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, we did some the fastest VPNs in the world and firewalls. Mm -hmm. um, we won the fastest uh, firewall, uh, fastest VPN at network interrupt 98, you know, mm. network interrupt itself no longer exists. So, mm. you know, that's, <laughs> that's how far back that goes. Uh, later working with gigabit wireless and then working with uh, 
uh, you know, with supply chain in the recent past last 10, 12 years. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's been a journey that's gone from embedded systems, uh, you know, writing, uh, you know, uh, token bucket wireless routers in 2000 lines of opcodes uh, to cloud architectures, like an entire technical journey. But also I've grown uh, in understanding how to uh, deliver a solution that meets a business need and not just a technical need. So Brilliant, that's yeah. been my journey in a variety of ways. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, it's uh, great. You kind of seem to combine your rich expertise in startups along with your tech expertise as well as now with investments, right? And something that struck me, Ranjit, as you were talking about it is how you've seen like these different eras of cloud, um, not yeah. just cloud, tech uh, growth in itself, right? I would say different iterations and how it's moved. Um, and now you're also involved in generative AI. Why don't you tell us, like, how do you see this being different from how you you have these hype cycles with tech, right? So yeah. um, what's your perspective? Is this more of a hype cycle? Do you see real impact across? And you called out how it's impacting across industries. I'd love to hear your perspective about that. Um, and also how you are probably building in this space personally as well. Okay. Uh, no, no, I, I agree, right? Uh, I mean, I think... Uh... Generative AI is impactful across all industries and, in fact, mm -hmm. across uh, all countries. And I mm -hmm. think, uh, like you said, democratizing the access to the stack, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So right now, uh, I think we are getting a big part of the access from outside. Uh, mm -hmm. And India has its own strengths. And I think we have a lot of smart people who can build solutions for the world. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, we built UPI, we built ONDC. Uh, UPI mm -hmm. has gone out to multiple mm -hmm. countries. Uh, ONDC is going out. So that's a great way to democratize the stack. Uh, mm -hmm. We could do that for the AI stack as well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you, when you, uh, I think to uh, jump on to, I think the next structure that you had, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at uh, AI, there are, I think, four pillars. Starting at the bottom, you have the hardware, uh, mm -hmm. right? And then you have uh, uh, the cloud on top, along with the data residency and mm -hmm. the data privacy. Uh, mm -hmm. Right uh, above the cloud, you have uh, you know the actual algorithms, uh, you know the foundational models, the base LLM uh, models uh, that you would actually run in the cloud, and maybe at the edge as well, uh, mm -hmm. at the core and at the edge. Mm -hmm. And then above that would be the applications, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so I think India's strength as of today, mm -hmm. uh, right, is uh, in the applications. We understand how to use uh, and expand. Uh, you know, the applications for the open mm -hmm. AI. I think there's a, there's a quite a few people who understand it. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, the hardware, the cloud, and, uh, you know, um, if you look at it, um, the LLM, uh, the foundational mm -hmm. models is where actually we need to uh, grow ourselves, uh, mm -hmm. our skill set, uh, before mm -hmm. we can offer it to the world, right? Okay. Uh, so okay. talking about LLMs, right? You know, what is an LLM? Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things you had wanted uh, so an LLM uh, is a large language model and the way it works uh, is, you know, can, kind of very technical. You teach it how to predict the next word, next word, mm -hmm. and that's how it builds up. Mm. A different way to think about it, which is not necessarily how it works, but how you can conceive, oh, I think it works like this, right? So it's easier mm -hmm. to understand. Think of mm -hmm. an LLM as a very, very smart and precise search mm -hmm. engine mm -hmm. that can find the exact article, the best article in the world that... Mm. Uh, that meets your question. So you ask a, a specific question, you get the most precise answer in the world. Mm. It may pick two or three such answers and combine them together. Mm -hmm. And that is the generative aspect of it. So not exactly how it actually works, but mm -hmm. you can think of it like that. So if you think, mm. of, think of it as the smartest search engine in the world that can also cobble together uh, the final uh, output for you, uh, mm -hmm. that is what an LLM works like. And so you can build applications on top mm -hmm. uh, and you need to have the underlying cloud uh, with the data residency and data privacy laws and the mm. underlying heart. Um, mm. And I think we have um, some progress on data residency laws throughout the world, mm -hmm. some progress on data privacy. I think India has laws in, uh, in the stage, uh, you know, uh, being worked on as well. Mm. We could actually provide uh, not just a democratization leadership in AI stack, but also mm. in the data residency and data privacy because mm. AI is driven by data. So we have a lot of people, we have a lot of data uh, mm. that makes us one of the most uh, exciting markets to be in. Mm. Um, so mm. very roughly, uh, 
capturing. I think that's the four stack, the four but, layers of the yeah. AI stack, and where yeah. India stands. Uh, I yeah. hope that I'm yeah, no, that was helpful. So I'm going to unpack that a bit, right? You spoke about a lot of very interesting things. So first of all, the stack in itself, as you call that, you have your computer or a hardware. And then you spoke about the cloud, which has your data privacy and the governance, which sits within it, right? And data residency, of course. And then the LLMs itself, and finally the application layer, right? And for the benefit of the audience, probably maybe can we talk about like a couple of examples of uh, companies which play across the stack, the entire vertical the, area and then maybe uh, companies which play only at the application level right so for example open ai would be someone who plays across the stack so i'd love for you to give me a couple yeah. of examples for um, across maybe domains as well about people sure. uh, or companies which play across both and what's the pros and cons of each that's going to be very helpful okay um, so uh, you know uh, let's take google for an uh, as an example right uh, mm -hmm. uh, so google owns their cloud uh, mm -hmm. Below the cloud, they own the hardware because they've got the tensor GPUs and uh, you know other hardware that they've yeah. built, uh, right? So they own um, the underlying hardware in the cloud. Then mm -hmm. they own their own cloud, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they also own the edge devices. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a good understanding of data privacy. So they, you know, as you can see, Google already fits that those two mm -hmm. layers. Uh, mm -hmm. They have their own LLM layer. They have launched Bard. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the Android applications uh, and uh, the Google Cloud applications, uh, you know, mm -hmm. those also use Google's LLM. So that's a vertically yeah. integrated uh, AI company. Uh, like you said, OpenAI yeah. is there. Uh, you know, that's another example. But I, I gave Google because so many people have a Google phone yeah. and they're experiencing these changes as the mm -hmm. days go by. Um, okay. So I think that's one. Uh, mm -hmm. I think somebody uh, who d may not have their own hardware, uh, is let's say Microsoft, but they own everything cloud and above. So they have mm -hmm. their own clouds, they have uh, their own LLM, and they have, you know, which is open AI, because uh, uh, they've invested deeply into that. And then they have their huge applications on top, uh, you know, which is uh, the Microsoft Office doing a fantastic job, uh, you know, with the AI. So I think that's a company that may not necessarily be uh, in all the four layers, but still uh, delivering at a fantastic mm -hmm. level by virtue of their excellence and their skill. Uh, so I think right. those are a couple of the examples I, I can give. Yeah. Absolutely. And and you spoke about how with respect to like an example like India, right, where most of the focus seems to lie within the application layer right now in terms of maturity and where we can move deeper in terms of focusing on building out our own NLMs. So um, I'd love to talk about two things on that, right? One, like at application level, so I was speaking to a company, uh, Ranjit, uh, this was, uh, I think they were building out uh, curated products for healthcare, right? Uh, a curated application for healthcare and built on the base models per se. And um, I think even there, they have fine tuning, um, they're fine tuning models over uh, the foundation. Okay. So I would still say okay. they... Uh, fall slightly below but then compared to say other companies right i think i spoke to another startup which was looking at building only at the application layer so i think some kind of photo editing uh, capabilities completely on the base models so okay. uh, one question i have is if you're playing only at the application layer it seems like something which is not very defensible per se right like you could have replications and what's your value proposition in itself because tech in itself is not a, a huge value proposition there right in terms of being able to uh, have a moat. So I'm curious to understand when you say right now India is playing at yes. that level. Uh, do you see that as being a sustainable uh, track uh, got it. in progress? Got it, got it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's a fantastic way to put it. I think uh, LLMs are a great equalizer, like you said. Mm. And so uh, the value add that you add on top of an LLM uh, mm -hmm. needs to be very carefully cultivated and nurtured mm. and uh, you need a significant customer focus. You need your own focus. Now, mm -hmm. one of the things about an LLM, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think we need to focus on the LLMs at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, so an L uh, just give me a second. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about that. Um, no. What mm -hmm. happens with an LLM is, uh, um, you know, it is, it is the be world's best search engine. But the mm. expert is not the LLM, the expert is you, right? Mm. Uh, so that's the, that's one way of differentiating, 
uh, right? Mm-hmm. If you ask an average question uh, to the LLM, to the AI, it'll mm-hmm. give you um, an average answer, as in, as in like a muddied answer. It'll give you a muddied answer to a muddied question. Mm-hmm. Um, right? If you ask it a question about, uh, uh, you know, uh, that a question that is on the difficult side of AI, right? Mm-hmm. Will AI take over the world? I mm-hmm. think when it provides an answer, it is only looking at publications and books mm-hmm. that it goes to and provides an answer. It's not saying that AI will take over the world, right? Mm-hmm. So what happens is it, it is how you approach AI and how you question it from your pers- from your experience and your expertise. So mm-hmm. that's one way for Indians uh, to uh, get into this and build a moat, be experts mm-hmm. at understanding how to deal with AI. Mm-hmm. Second is the application on top. Mm-hmm. Another aspect is the LLMs themselves may have a different focus. Some mm-hmm. LLMs are multimodal, some focus mm-hmm. on uh, images. Uh, um, you know, th- there are some LLMs that are do- doing fantastic work in image, but they cannot do it in other areas. So depending on the work, uh, so if two competitors pick different LLMs, uh, your choice of LLM itself may propel you to success or hold you back. So mm-hmm. it's not that every LLM is an equal. Um, so I think these factors are the ones that we'll have to look at. Um, mm-hmm which LLM you choose, uh, how much is your expertise, how do you yeah. query uh, the LLM as an expert, and then the value add on top as a customer-focused yeah. person. I think that's, uh, does that answer some of it? Yeah. No, it does, it does. And it kind of reminds me of this article. I think it was from one of the VC firms uh, where they had spoken about the relevance of Gen AI uh, in B2B versus B2C. And like you rightly called out, uh, in B2B applications, you your need for accuracy is very high, right? It's not like consumer facing applications. When I'm talking to a celebrity, how I talk to Steve Jobs, is that right, wrong? There's no, that's all right, right? Like there's no need for absolute accuracy in that case versus B2B where there is a need for accuracy. And I think what they had rightly called out was what you called out that, um, in such situations, the human uh, inputs and the context uh, is going to be more important, right? And in which cases, um, the LLM and Gen AI acts more of a coach versus automating the task. So it still provides value, but it provides value as a coach and not necessarily replicating or duplicating your uh, effort. Yeah. So I think that's very uh, helpful in terms of building out your defensible strategy. Now, coming to the second part of it in terms of, okay, say, uh, democratizing AI and we work on focusing on building our own LLMs, I can top of mind think of multiple ways in which this is going to be helpful, even from a tech perspective, right, bringing in diversity of data in itself, like we have huge data, uh, regional content, content which is uniquely um, from our country, right? I think the representation of that and the, making it more inclusive in itself for me is a big win. But I'm very curious to understand what would be the... what what according to you across the different levels from okay. tech to the other layers, will there Got be a benefit of having our own LLM? Got it. Um, so, um, uh, so for instance, if we have our own LLM, right? Um, mm-hmm. So there's a concept known as steerability, uh, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, so, you know, maybe we can adapt a more steerable LLM, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe we can adapt uh, an LLM uh, that is more explanatory. Mm. And we, maybe we can ad- adapt or create an LLM uh, that is more stackable in terms of mm. training. Mm. Uh, now what happens is now suddenly you have a super flexible uh, LLM. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, the earlier concept where you said, okay, my fine tuning has to be based on top of my foundational mm. training. Mm. Uh, so the foundational training is a sunk cost. But imagine mm. that if you are stackable and steerable, right, yeah. uh, with explanatory, now suddenly mm. that foundational uh, even though it's a sunk cost, because it's stackable, you can keep building with your uh, new training, uh, which is, you know, which is kind of like a fine tuning, but much superior. And mm-hmm. so you eventually build your way uh, to uh, a newer level of training without mm-hmm. uh, throwing away the, uh, the earlier costs that were incurred on the training, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the, mm-hmm. the prior training that you did. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's one area where having, uh, you know, your own LLM or growing or adapting uh, so, you know, um, as, as you and I have discussed, there are concepts, I mean, there are availability, like uh, Red Pajama has uh, data sets that are available. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Dolly is there um, mm-hmm. by Databricks. Uh, you know, there's Llama from Meta that became Alpaca and then Alpaca 2.0 and, you know, things like that. So there's a lot of models that are available. There's a lot of data sets that are available. Uh, we have a rich uh, uh, set of data. Uh, and then, you know, we have a lot of people who can, provide uh, multi-language items. If you look at the GPT-4 paper, uh, it actually deals with, uh, 
uh, what it calls scarce resource languages, mid resource languages, and mm-hmm. uh, rich resource. So rich resources, you know, very obviously English is one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, for for mid resource, uh, the GPT four paper picks up Marathi, uh, mm-hmm. and for uh, for uh, scarce resource, it picks up uh, Swahili and Welsh. Mm-hmm. And uh, interestingly, the performance of the LLM for even for scarce resource languages is not too bad actually it's it's very close reasonably mm. close to the to the english language uh, performance mm. um mm. so that so you know that's where we are in terms of a good robust foundational llm then mm. we add the stability stackability explainability on top and uh, with the india uh, data sets coming in uh, we would have a fantastic uh, gpt that could actually work in uh, in africa in australia uh, in europe wherever there are multiple languages just like india has mm-hmm. um, and uh, that would be one way for us to democratize the stack and contribute to it mm-hmm. so then that begs the question ranjit as to what probably uh, prevents or prohibits us or what could prohibit um, us from building that out i can think of cost i can think of maturity um, of startups in this space but yes. would love to hear your perspective what do you think would be prohibiting us or is prohibiting us from getting there yeah uh, i think um, i think what has been achieved right now by open ai is sort of the ferrari of uh, mm. of open ai is right it's fantastic it goes from 0 to 60 immediately but it costs a lot of money right mm. as you said it's prohibitively expensive mm. Mm. i think uh, uh, you know india being where it is uh, it's it's a fantastic economy that's growing very well uh, mm. but i think there are also some constraints on frugality and profitability uh, i don't think uh, there are companies in india that can uh, spend 500 million dollars to build the llm and then take it forward i mean that's that's a fact of uh, life right uh, so i think we are looking at llms becoming a little smaller as we understand them better uh, mm-hmm. and uh, as we shrink them to work at the edge so some of the overheads of an llm needs to come down the flexibility has to go up and uh, you will find that india is poised to succeed as mm. soon as uh, some of the costs come down the complexity is uh, brought down in terms of uh, you will get the same performance at a lower complexity i think there are steps being made mm. and the flexibility goes up so the prior uh, training is not burned because you now have uh, uh, you know the ability to stack training on top of each other mm. i think that point is coming soon and that's when i think the india scene will explode not just at the apps as it has but also one level below so because of this we are actually going down the stack so we mm. started at apps then we are going into the llms mm. um, and then we can look at the hard and the hardware and the cloud aspects of it so that's what okay. i have to say so what i'm hearing is it is uh, something which will unfold um sometime soon as we mature in this space yeah 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 so with that uh, i think that's a good segue for us to move over to our third section right we spoke about um, why there is a need for us to democratize ai we spoke about what the tech stack looks like and uh, the different players within each so um again kind of building on our previous point uh, let's talk about like what are the pillars of the gpt ecosystem today and specifically okay. set stage to how that what that means to india as a country okay for india as a country right uh, i think app space uh, there are probably a, uh, you know probably all our viewers are at least as knowledgeable as i am if not probably further ahead in implementing all that stuff um i think llms we need to look at you know the aspects that we just spoke about uh, right picking the right llm as a basis for growth uh, developing one on our own from scratch uh, i think we have the resources and wherewithal within the country to do it mm-hmm. um, i think then if you go down the stack then it's the cloud so uh, the cloud is significantly defined by uh, the hardware Uh, like the compute that you said compute storage a network and also the data right mm. um, so we have a data privacy we have the right to data privacy mm. um, and then how does that get fed into uh, the ai machine so to speak the ai engine runs on the data oil um, mm. so how do we feed that data into the ai machine so we need uh, rules that uh, maybe compensate people for the use of their data Uh, mm. so you know we can provide leadership to the world in terms of uh, um, you know for instance data can be personally identifiable information pii uh, mm-hmm. or the which is a pii is for personal use uh, highly mm-hmm. confidential that's that is protected by right to privacy uh, there's non pii personal data that can be 
an opt in mechanism unless i opt in you cannot use my data and then mm. there could be aggregate uh, non pii data where that can be mm-hmm. opt out and mm. so if you have a graded level of protection uh, not only can people be protected but so can companies and the commercial interests which obviously mm. are equally important because companies provide a lot of livelihood to a lot of people mm. uh, and uh, you know there's a lot of uh, concern about gen ai taking jobs away but mm-hmm. gen ai can also put a spotlight on these individual privacy needs and how do we generate jobs and revenue uh, you know jobs for people revenue for companies um, and you know for instance if i as a venture capitalist if i were to see a solution um, that comes in with this sort of a structure and you know india is uniquely positioned uh, with its digi locker for instance right mm-hmm. so people keep their pii data in the digi locker mm-hmm. uh, but somehow the data tenancy or the uh, uh, or the agreements are uh, captured on a blockchain not the mm-hmm. data itself but the the mm-hmm. agreements and uh, in return for sharing data i get you know 2 cents a month uh, mm-hmm. you know or uh, or 35 rupees a month or you know whatever the uh, right, you however you convert it Mm-hmm. um then that would actually uh, provide a holistic solution that could be india's contribution to the world in terms of data privacy residency universal basic income protecting rights but also feeding the ai machine with data people getting compensated in response uh, generating revenue protecting jobs creating new jobs i think there's a fantastic level of leadership that india is showing and can take it forward and i think that is india's role in the gpt revolution that's coming that's very very interesting i think i love those points right uh, calling out how we can build uniquely on what we are good at and um, while at the same time providing some kind of compensation which i think is a, a completely new space for all of us right including india um i'd love to uh, talk a bit about the flip side right where where, where do you think india is lagging and uh, how can it move forward especially i can think about the amount of impact it could have on sectors from like healthcare the amount of yeah. folks who do not have access to good healthcare yeah. right so a um, lot of opportunities but where do you think we are lagging and how can we move ahead so, so i think i think that's a very valid point uh, uh, right uh, i think having local tech available uh, is important in terms of Uh, the frugality and monetization uh, mm-hmm. because uh, you know one of the missions of the government is to reach out to the neediest of the citizens right uh, mm-hmm. if you think about uh, you know for instance how we do upi today how we use mm-hmm. uber or mm-hmm. ola or any other uh, but actually underlying there are two revolutions that happened in the past one was uh, for instance for uber it was a small car you know the way the government shepherded the small car manufacturing in india right uh, mm-hmm. you cannot mm-hmm. import a uh, a suzuki from japan and run an uber but if you make it in india it's much easier to do it right so that's one uh, similarly i think our data rates were and maybe still are the lowest in the world that yeah. enables uh, the neediest citizens to reach out to their doctors on a whatsapp data call without mm. burning a hole in their pocket uh, so i think mm. this level of leadership that the government has shown has fostered uh, can mm. continue to uh, you know uh, shine a light on the way forward uh, mm. i think mm. that's what i'm looking for uh, Uh, right uh, mm-hmm. companies uh, to step forward and for governments mm-hmm. to uh, for the government to come in and aid such uh, companies by creating a, a collaborative and supportive ecosystem which i think mm-hmm. we've already seen with upi and ondc so that's where yeah. i'm seeing uh, the growth within india come in in a collaborative manner that's brilliant yeah i i love the examples right which have peppered across the conversation where we've shown that we could be way ahead um with the upi story for example or how you called out around the data it's uh, the amount we tend to underestimate what we take for granted right something which becomes very evident when we are not in the country so absolutely with you on that one um you spoke about how um companies can kind of pitch in and look at the space so uh, love to understand your view on uh, what will india need to invest in ah. Got it. Right. Um, Got it. Would love to touch upon that a bit. Could you talk? I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, uh, like we built small cars in India, right? We had to invest in plants, hardware. The government fostered these agreements with foreign governments, uh, enabled foreign investment. I think at the hardware level, uh, we have fantastic design houses within India. I think mm-hmm. global companies are designing their chips within India as well. uh mm-hmm. we do not have fabs within india i think that's government has already taken steps towards that mm-hmm. so uh, just like we invested in manufacturing plants for cars and automation and uh, and the robotics along with human assisted manufacturing 
I think we'll have to look at not only the design of hardware within India, uh, mm-hmm. the chips that are already happening, uh, but also uh, the actual manufacturing. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we have fabulous companies within India, but uh, or you know some of the, uh, but we do not have. Uh, the actual manufacturing that's one key area where mm. if you generate the hardware within the country uh, mm. initially yes it's a high expense but yeah. uh, but for uh, achieving uh, a scale mm-hmm. i think that's what we need uh, mm. and then you go up the hardware into the cloud mm. and uh, notice that we already have a movement from the apps down to the llm now if yeah. you have a movement from the hardware to the cloud and mm. uh, you've already sorted the data privacy and residency uh, you do then have all of the pieces you need within mm. India uh, to mm. provide, a, you know, a scalable, cost-effective, mm. frugal solution mm. that works uh, for every citizen, no matter how shallow, uh, you know, uh, 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 their uh, their need is or their ability to communicate uh, in a certain language or what whatever it mm. might be, uh, mm. right? So whether somebody has deep pockets, whether somebody has shallow pockets, whether mm-hmm. somebody is based in a certain region, whether somebody speaks mm-hmm. a certain language, all mm-hmm. of these can be solved when mm-hmm. all of these four factors are met together. So mm-hmm. apps and LLMs are, is coming, like we are going the journey down the stack, hardware mm-hmm. and then cloud, we need to go up the stack and mm-hmm. data residency privacy is kind of coming in from the side from the government. Mm-hmm. These meet together and then that's where the companies can play and generate a democratized solution that can go out to the world actually. So, yeah, no, I, I love that answer, right? And it could, like you called out, become like a truly level playing field, bringing in tech for good uh, as it was intended to be. Um, if we can kind of uh, wrap that sentiment up with what does it mean from the first two personas, right? Like we spoke about governments, we spoke about what it means to the country. What does it mean for startups building in this space? Right. Uh, I've spoken to a bunch of startups for building from here for the world. So your advice and uh, your perspective on what it means or for the startups who are building and then for the workforce itself, who are either entering or trying to figure out where they fit in within this entire ecosystem. So could you talk about these two personas right. and how they can fit in? Sure. So um, so I think, uh, you know, I'll talk about the lower part of the stack first and get that mm-hmm. out of the way. So mm-hmm. I think. Um, I think at the hardware level, you know, we uh, we need companies to come together and maybe build AI chips and what have you. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think that's a long term uh, thing. Um, I think uh, then you go up the stack and you reach the cloud and uh, we do have existing cloud providers. And if they import the right hardware or they get the government support for the right hardware design, I think they can move. Moving on from there to actually where we are currently engaged. Uh, uh, you reach the LLM and the LLM or the, you know, one of them being chat GPT, which is GPT 3.5 mm-hmm. uh, and then GPT 4 is 500 times uh, more, uh, has 500 times more parameters or co- complexity, however you look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's what people have interacted the most with. And, uh, you know, there's a fear of oh, what will happen to my job. I think the way to look at it is uh, it's a new tool. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, it's very good. Uh, it mm-hmm. does not have intelligence on its own the way we think of sentient intelligence, uh, mm-hmm. you know, at least not today, uh, mm-hmm. right? So it's a great search tool, a fantastic search tool. I think people need to familiarize themselves with it, uh, right? If you don't familiarize yourself with it, uh, yes, you could lose a job to some other human being, not to the machine. Uh, you could lose it to some other human being who's better at that tool than you are, and which, you know, makes a lot of sense. If somebody's better at a tool, they will probably get the job easier, faster, maybe more well-paid, right? So that's where com- people are focused right now. Uh, and I think above that, when you go to the apps, uh, you know, uh, I think the amount of medical data that we have, the amount of mm. financial data that we have, mm. I think that's where companies that are playing, the amount of data itself that we have, uh, how are we monetizing the data? How are we protecting the data? What are the solutions to build mm. that at scale? Uh, mm. I think these are the areas that people need to uh, be dabbling in uh, yeah. and just pick a specific focus. Uh, make sure you pick the right LLM. Make sure it's steerable. Make sure it's stackable. It's explanatory. Mm. With mm. the right foundations, I think the companies can provide a global solution in a very short period of time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when we invest, that's also what we're looking for is mm. not just what is the problem you're solving, but how are you solving it? And, you know, like you asked, how do you differentiate yourself? Yeah. So that yeah. deep level of understanding by a founder would tell us that that specific company and yeah. its solution and its founders uh, know why they can build it better than anybody else. Right? Mm. So, 
So yeah. I think those are the areas I would uh, suggest focusing on for people at an individual level, as uh, mm-hmm. well as founders and companies at a corporate level, at a startup. Yeah. Level. I think that's very sage advice, um, Ranjit. Right? I sometimes when you talk to a uh, few of them, it seems more like a hammer in search of a nail. Everyone mm-hmm. likes tiny toys, right? Everyone mm-hmm. likes to play around with it. But at the end of the day, are you solving for jobs to be done? Starting with what the problem is, and who are you actually solving for those things uniquely? I think that's what differentiates companies which continue to exist. And you called out rightly across the layers. The opportunity set exists, and absolutely right. At the data layer itself, there's just so many of these jobs that exist which could be solved for very uniquely again, right? Uh, for both India and for the world. So that that's um, I think a good um, conclusion to this. So before um, we get to your concluding thoughts, one uh, interesting thing I've been asking my guests is around. Uh, you probably have come across multiple startups. I'm very curious to understand what's the one which has kind of blown you away, right? It could be applications or it could be a company, but someone who's building in this space, which has absolutely blown you away in terms of the use case and what it could mean for the future of tech. Um, whatever is top of mind for you. Can you think of one? Um, yeah, so uh, th- there's one that came in with uh, medical usage. Uh, mm-hmm. I-, I can't go into details, uh, mm-hmm. but there's one that came in for a medical usage uh, and they were thinking so far ahead that uh, mm-hmm. I was not sure if it was science fiction or, you know, uh, uh, right? Because, you know, people are just so amazingly uh, forward looking. They, you know, they don't let things weigh themselves down. They're like, okay, I have 10 problems. Here, I put the 10 on the side and the way they think. So mm-hmm. there's this medical startup that's actually using Gen AI uh, to uh, scale the problem in a way that I had actually not imagined could be done. Uh, mm-hmm. And and the way they are doing it, uh, uh, I don't know if they'll succeed, but it's worth taking the risk just because you know nobody's thought about doing it like this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so um, so that's actually what I would, uh, yeah. uh, you know. Unfortunately, I can't get into details uh, because yeah, yeah. you know we have a thing. Right. Uh, but but those are the risks that actually come to us. I can definitely talk about the risks. Uh, mm-hmm. Is we understand what they're trying to do. We understand why they think that will work. Uh, but it's so far out there that uh, we're like, okay, is anybody else even looking for this as a solution? Mm-hmm. Or is it that these guys have already figured out how to reach Mount Everest, whereas we're trying to find the railway station to get to Nepal to reach Mount Everest? You know, so yeah. so sometimes the founders are so far ahead of you. Uh, yeah. I think, and Gen AI is a multiplicative factor in that sense. Yeah. A really, really sharp and smart founder uh, mm-hmm. multiplied by Gen AI is so far ahead sometimes of you that you can't even see the future, right? That's how, yeah. that's actually a little scary for us as well, so. It is, it is. It's the best of times, it's the worst of times, right? Sometimes you feel equally thrilled and equally fearful. Uh, no, I hear you. I think uh, uh, I was talking to someone and we spoke about how use cases, right? Move from, uh, okay, you're going fast. Can we do it 5X faster? It's more of an efficiency mm-hmm. game to the other end where you're looking at it from first principle and completely disrupting uh, the way we yeah. are doing Right. So if you're crossing a river, think about different ways of crossing it versus should I build a faster boat? So I think there are people looking at it from both ends. And it's very interesting how this entire thing is unwrapping itself. Um, with that, I'd love to hear your concluding thoughts, Ranjit, before we wrap up. The, I think we've covered a lot of ground starting from your journey. Uh, you spoke about your experiments in this space. We spoke a lot about the tech stack in itself and the democratization or the need to democratize it. And then finally concluding it with what it means um, for us as a country based on where we are, what are we poised to grow and areas where we can um, pick up on, right? So with that, could you like yeah. share your concluding thoughts across this theme? Well, my first observation is that you are a wonderful prompt engineer because you've been prompting me at the right time with the right <laughs> questions. But, but you know, that's truly the expertise, right? So uh, you know, more seriously, like with chat GPT, uh, mm-hmm. right uh, the expertise that you bring in uh, mm-hmm. right you are the expert not the gpt the gpt is right. a fantastic library search tool but you are the expert you have to know how to ask and ask mm-hmm. at the right time the right way uh, mm-hmm. so there's a lot of skill set out there for people to learn in india and mm-hmm. abroad um, right um, i think when you look at the hardware side of things mm-hmm. uh, uh, we need a government initiative and they have taken the initiative with respect to building chips uh, so we need a focus on AI-friendly chips, so to speak, because uh, there are 
certain data access patterns that need to build in at a hardware level and things like that so that's mm. at the hardware level i think that's what we we would like to see but that's a very long term play right mm. so that's a 5 10 15 year mm. play uh, mm. right then you go up the stack cloud clouds can be built much faster mm. i think there there are uh, data center and cloud uh, you know cloud building uh, uh, incentives from the government that have already kicked in uh, so that's good to see Uh, mm-hmm. right but you are, you also want a free market initiative not just government funding and grants mm-hmm. and startups are trying to get into that space uh, that's still a, a bit of a long term play or maybe a few years or so i uh, would love to see more on that front uh, then you come to the uh, the apps uh, sorry uh, to the llms that we spoke about i think that is truly where india can shine in the moment this is india's right. moment to shine at the llms mm-hmm. uh, we have fantastic number of people uh, huge amounts of data a multi modal uh, you know multi language uh, uh, and you know multimedia you know text uh, audio video we can ingest and we produce right i mean the various film industries in india produce significant amount of yep. multimedia output uh, web series uh, you know ott all that stuff so we are a super super rich ecosystem in that sense uh, mm-hmm. in those various areas Uh, and i think llms that can help us consume this uh, mm. will and and then take it forward is where india will shine in the immediate moment uh, mm-hmm. we talk about the next year or so uh, mm-hmm. and i think apps uh, people are already actually making so so i think mm-hmm. uh, from apps uh, to llms uh, to cloud to hardware the journey gets longer and requires deeper uh, government yeah. support uh, yeah. conversely uh, if you go up the stack it's uh, mm-hmm. the journeys are faster and mm. uh, you know directly driven by startup investment and less government uh, so that's mm. what i see and that's how i would expect uh, investments to happen over the near future so Brilliant. i hope Brilliant. that captures yeah that that was wonderful i love the uh, conceptual view of what you've called out right and i think our viewers would love that too thanks a lot ranjit that was such a pleasure chatting with you and i i think i'm leaving uh, personally learning more about what it means to democratize the ai stack than i did when i started so thank you for time and uh, thank you everyone until we meet you again in the next episode of generative ai and i thank you ranjit